Hey, Happy New Year. Let's go look at the garden. Welcome to Black Gumbo Southern Gardening. It's a new year. I hope this is going to be a better year for all of us. And uh, well, gardens don't recognize the new year, so the garden's still growing. It's January the 1st, and I have lots of stuff. In fact, I'm going to harvest some things today. I thought I'd take you along on our January garden tour, see what's going on. Can you have too much rain in a garden? Yes. Got some thunderstorms rolling in. A cold front passed through last night, stopped right offshore, and then backed up as a warm front, dragging all this rain with it. So we got thunderstorms today. And our ground is already pretty saturated, so yeah. It really affects the plants. You can see when we get a lot of rain, this black gumbo clay does not drain very well, and so the water just sits on the top. And Phoebe walks through it and then tracks mud through the house. <laughs> That's why I have a raised bed. My raised bed garden drains and the water flows out through the topsoil, um, but it doesn't pool up. However, too much rain is not liked by plants. These beets here have had too much rain over the past couple of uh, several, well, past month. And these Brussels sprouts here, you can see the discoloration on those leaves. Uh, I believe that's due to too much rain, just too much water. There's plenty of nutrition in this soil, but you can see as the plants mature and they start to reach their maturity times, some of the discoloration happens. That's a combination of factors, but certainly the rain doesn't help. Nothing you can do about it though, except maybe fertilize once it stops raining and see if you can give these plants a final boost. So yeah, this, this is too much rain and too much competition with the surrounding plants. It's pretty brisk out here today, at least for, for the coast of Texas. It's pretty chilly today, but look at all this food. We have just had a pretty heavy rainfall and the ground is, is pretty soaked and all that rainfall that we've been having lately has caused my garden to experience some trouble. Um, you can actually have too much water on your plants, and I think that's what's going on. But, uh, but for the most part, everything's wonderful. A lot of my crops are maturing now, and uh, as they mature, they start to look kind of haggard. But I've also been harvesting, and I'll show you what's going on. All right, first things first. My uh, little 2x6 bed here has uh, done very well this year. You can see there's not much left in it. I've been harvesting radishes, these uh, English breakfast radishes, and uh, I need to clear those out. Um, I don't like them so much, and I don't use them much, so that's going to compost. <clears throat> this little pepper plant, this is that habanada. Yeah, that's a, that's a nice little fruit. Mm, pretty sweet. Yeah, that's a good pepper. So this habanero pepper is actually called a habanada. And that's why I can sit here and eat it in front of you. <laughs> it doesn't have any heat. It's uh, stunted and coming out soon along with the radishes. And I'll have this bed clear and I'll amend it and get it ready for spring planting. Uh, all the herbs and the things in pots, everything's looking a little haggard from the weather. Those peppers over there, peppers just don't like to grow during the winter. However, they are putting on a few fruits every now and then. Rosemary's just fine, all the fig trees are asleep, so and that's everything going on up here on the patio. But here's where the wonders are going. Look at this lime tree. I've got so many blossoms here, it's been bringing in tons and tons of bees. I've got my final blood orange, this tiny little fellow right here just waiting to be eaten. And yeah, this, this one here though, this is my Kishu Mandarin. And it's not doing so well, and I've been trying over several videos showing you some progress to nurse this back. Um, the, the new leaves are nice and green, except for things like that. I'm not sure what's going on here. This plant was stressed by being overshaded during the summer and fall, and I think that's just uh, gonna require some pruning and 
tender loving care. This lettuce is almost ready to bolt. I've got to eat it or use it. These are my peas and they're putting on lots and lots of, of uh, pods here. It's a wonderful thing to be able to come out and eat peas from the garden. A lot of chickweed down in there. But uh, yeah, they've got new blossoms on them. Tons of new blossoms. And uh, I've just really been enjoying the peas. So uh, these I'll let them produce until I need this bed or until they mature and die on their own. I've got a bunch of cilantro here. It's going to bolt soon. And I might let it so I can get some coriander seed. But uh, yeah, that's a big batch of herbs that if you need cilantro, you just come and grab a big, big batch of it. Um, over here, I think this whole bed over here has been suffering from overwatering. I want to show you these spinach plants. Look how they're, they're not so green. The new leaves in here are, are fine, but these out here, those started to turn yellow at the last big rain event we had. It almost looks like a magnesium deficiency or a, some sort of nutri nutrient deficiency, but I think it's overwatering. You can see that happening on a lot of these plants. As they mature, these are uh, uh, radishes and these are turnips. As they start to mature and end, uh, you know, reach the end of their life cycle, they're going to want to bolt, but they're older plants now. Now they're really dense in there because, well, they're big. And they're starting to shade one another out and leaves on the bottom are turning yellow. That's just natural. But uh, I would come in here and it's time to harvest beets, not beets, turnips. We've had a lot of turnips. I ate some turnips the other day. They were roasted turnips. Man, they were delicious, like, like candy. So fantastic. So I've got a lot of turnips in, in here to harvest and make use of. Okay, I have to report on this. This is purple top white globe turnip and I've roasted them about an hour at uh, 400 degrees a little more a little less you want them to get some color on them like that nice and caramelized inside but I also since I was roasting cut up some of these Chinese red meat radishes and there's another couple of kinds in there wow these Chinese red, Chinese red meat radishes they're fantastic and of course I took the greens and mixed up a batch of greens with a ham, a piece of ham. So it's beautiful, man. This is so delicious. Look at these beautiful flowers. This is my bok choy. It's a small bok choy, but it's bolting. They have gone to seed, most of them. There's some back there that are a little slow. And this is my yod fa. It's a Chinese kale. It tastes like broccoli. And right here, with that little flower head on it, that's when you want to harvest this stuff. And I've been eating this as well. I've got a lot of dill here, and I harvested some dill, and I'm drying it. I'm trying a method that is probably not tailored very well for dill. I'm air drying it and uh, trying to preserve some of, the, uh, some of the essential oils in this dill by air drying. But it's a wet herb. It's got a real wet stalk, and that requires, you know, maybe, maybe different methods. We'll see. Have you ever had collard greens? I've got some collards here. They're doing quite well in this container. Not as big, obviously, as the ones you're going to get in the garden bed, but uh, still pretty impressive for a, what is that, a, like a 15-gallon pot? Let's go look at the one in the ground. Here's a collard green in the ground, and it's doing a little bit better, but still not, not quite a bad job growing collard greens in a container. Right next to this collard green, though, I've got these mustard greens. Look at this. This is enormous. That's fantastic. This is called Green Wave, and they grew well in the spring, but they've really grown well in the fall. I mean, through the winter, these things put on these gigantic plate-sized leaves. It's just beautiful. Here's another one over here. Look at that. Isn't that fantastic? Since we're here, let's look at the kale. Again, I explain in every single garden tour the same thing. I feel like I'm repeating myself over and over, and you guys are just going to be bored hearing all about the same stuff and me saying the same things. But, yeah, folks seem to like the garden tours. This is kale that I'm growing for my son's uh, geese and chickens, and they return to me, and we eat them as eggs. So there's another cabbage over here. These cabbages are heading up. In fact, we're going to harvest some of these cabbages today because they're ready. I've got some carrots in here, and they're starting to put on root. 
<clears throat> although these down here are packed too tightly, once the ones start to um, root up on the edges where they're not so dense, I'll pull them out and that'll give room for these others deep in here to uh, put on some more root. These are little Parisian carrots and I planted them later than my other Parisian batch and uh, I'm already getting some carrots out of those little Parisians. They're nice little carrots. Perpetual spinach, you can see the slugs love this stuff. Snails and slugs, I need to throw out some iron phosphate pellets. The chickweed, this is kind of cool. The chickweed has bolted and is going to seed. You can see it's flowering there. I don't mind chickweed, you can actually eat chickweed. I just let it grow in the midst of my stuff here. We've got some Brussels sprouts over here amidst my radish patch. And you can see we're starting to get some little sprouts heading up on the stem there. That's encouraging. And one way I encouraged this to uh, get a little more healthy was I finally cleared away some of these radishes down here and pulled them up. In fact, let's pull up a radish right here next to that one. Look at these radishes. This is Chinese red meat. It's my favorite radish. I roasted some of these the other day and they were delicious. I uh, should stop trying other kinds of radishes because this is really the only one I like. One. As you can see, these other radishes over here are also looking a little worse for wear because of the, the snails. The snails are really in this bed quite heavily. I'm uh, probably not going to treat for snails because these radishes are coming out pretty soon and there will be no snail problem if there's nothing for them to eat. There we go. I'm kind of ready to just be done with these over here. This soil has been so loose that uh, many of the carrots are growing down in the soil without showing their tops, which makes it hard to tell if they're ready or not. Let's pull this guy. That's a little ox heart. A little baby ox heart. That's a nice shape, huh? We're going to eat this one. I'll add him with my radishes. I can't tell if these are Parisian. Or ox heart. That looks more like an ox heart. That looks more like a typical Parisian. Kind of all mixed in, but uh, I'll take them. This is one of those yellow French carrots that I don't know the, the how to pronounce it, but hey man, we're already pulling carrots out of the garden. It's New Year's Day. This is awesome. I also wanted to show you something here. On this these root systems, I don't know if you can see it very well, but there are some white fuzzy stuff in here. That is mycorrhizal fungi. And that fungus lives in your soil, and that's the important stuff to uh, keep in your soil or to encourage its growth in your soil. Mycorrhizal fungi has a symbiotic relationship with plant roots and helps the plants to be able to mine the uh, nutrition in the soil. There's some right there. I don't know, that's not coming through very well. I'll try to get a shot of that. That's a sign of healthy soil. That's encouraging to me. Look at these cabbages. This is the one we're gonna to take today. You can see that all the rain has caused them to swell up and start splitting. So this one is huge. I'm gonna eat some cabbage tonight. Uh, these others ought to be harvested pretty soon too. I could harvest any of these at any time, but this one's the giant one for now. So let's cut that out of there. All right, there are a couple ways you can go about harvesting a cabbage. Uh, you can just yank the whole thing out the best way is to twist and pull and you'll get some of the root system to come up or you can go in and just cut it off at the root system and that's what I'm going to do here if I can man that's a dense that's a dense root that's not coming out with a pocket knife we'll just do the old-fashioned method of twist and pull okay. now let's look at the underside of this down here you see how leaves that are starved of light get yellow. Now you could pull these off because what happens is that uh, you get uh, slugs and snails that make their homes under these leaves as they rest on the ground and if we go through here we'll find all kinds of slugs and snails. You can see from the holes, well if I could get a leaf, 
Hey, no ma'am. Phoebe wants to eat the cabbage. You can see when it touches the ground, the slugs and snails just eat holes in it. So, yeah, let's get this cleaned up. These go into the compost. You could eat these big leaves. Um, but for me, well, they're a little tough. I want the white part. I want the headed part. There we go. Here's what we got. That's not bad, is it? That's a pretty hefty cabbage. Well, when you start harvesting cabbages, you have a bare spot. So, what to do with a bare spot? I think I'm just going to let the soil rest. I'll throw some mulch over that and just let it rest. But, look at those beautiful cabbages. Isn't that a beautiful scene? That makes my heart glad. I've got that lettuce in the middle of it. It's been growing so well. Even harvesting it off it, it uh, just keeps going. Some of the lettuce is a little frost damage, but uh, for the most part, it's just these are troopers. I've got some radishes in here that I don't really care for. That is a Spanish black, and they're really, really potent. They're really powerful. If you like a strong radish, man, I can totally recommend this one. It's snow white on the inside, black on the outside. And, uh, well, I kind of grew them for the novelty of it all. But, uh, yeah, they're, uh, they're, pretty, they're pretty sharp. Uh, I'm going to pull some of these out of here and give some of my turnips room to spread out. You can see some of them mature and some of them don't. Phoebe, you're bumping my camera. I know you're terrified of fireworks. You don't have to come get in between my feet. I don't know what to do with these other than compost them at this time. These Spanish black radishes grow best in the in the cool weather in the fall. I've grown them in the spring and they end up just looking like this one here. Not well developed, rather small and, and puny. But if you want big ones like this, uh, and they'll get a little bit bigger than this, but I find them, this is, if you like hot radishes, this is when to, to grow them to this point. Uh, grow them in the fall. Now some people have got on my comment section and told me that I should donate this stuff. They told me that I'm wasting food if I grow direct to compost. Um, that's a nice one there. <clears throat> Friends, it's not a waste if I'm going to eat it later as compost. If I grow this to put it directly in the compost, uh, that's responsible uh, management of my garden. I'm growing food not to throw it away. Compost is not waste. People seem to have in their mind that compost is wasteful. But compost is black gold, man. It's garden gold. It feeds your garden. It feeds the next plant you grow. It's great stuff. So if you grow a crop and it turns out you don't like it, or you grow a crop and uh, intentionally to compost, there's nothing wrong with that at all. It's not a waste. If you want to donate your food, go for it. But I personally choose to use my resources and keep them on my property so that I can use them either this year or next. I can eat them now as radishes or I can eat them next year as whatever else I grow when I feed these radishes to my garden. This lemon tree is falling down on itself. This is incredible. When we take these lemons off of here, this is a Meyer lemon tree and it's, it's ready for harvest. In fact, my family's gonna have a harvesting day um, pretty soon here. But you can see how these lemons just weigh the whole tree down. Branches are weeping toward the ground. So uh, once we harvest these lemons, this tree will pop up another foot or two in height. In fact, there goes one on the ground. You know when they start dropping on their own, they're ready. So uh, lots, of, lots of good things we can do with this. See these trees here? These trees behind me? Yeah, Monday is their last day in my yard. I'm having these Bradford pear trees removed and all this jungly area cleared out because I'm going to grow citrus and an avocado tree in that area in pots. Well, in the summer, these things cause all kinds of shade and we like the shade, but they're useless trees. They're approaching 30 years old. They're near the end of their lifespan and uh, David the Good suggested that I actually cut them down 
uh, to the stump and let the new growth come up on them and graft real pears onto them. And I got to think that's a good idea and that was originally going to be part of the plan. The problem with that is these, this rootstock is already um, 30 years old and I don't think that that rootstock will last another 20 years to grow up a good mature pear tree. So we're just going to take them down and start over with this area, which is something I've been wanting to do for a long time. So finally going to do it. They're coming out. Makes me happy. Speaking of compost, the fall season is a wonderful time to find riches like that. These pumpkins, I'll cut them up. I'll take the seeds out so I get a bunch of pumpkin seeds growing in my garden. And I'll chop them and put them in my, in my uh, compost pile. These pumpkins are high in nitrogen, just like all this green leafy matter. In fact, let's go throw these in now. You can see I've gone around and got some sources of carbon from my neighbors. I'll just drop these right in here. I like to keep everything kind of piled up in one corner until this bed is full. And we'll add some carbon on top of that in our compost pile is going to be ready to start churning. So here's what we've harvested today on New Year's Day. Big cabbage, a bunch of radishes, a bunch of carrots, and I could harvest a bunch of lettuce and a bunch of peas if I really want to, but yeah, tonight, cabbage. So yeah, we've got a lot going on and I'm just, I'm just really happy with my winter garden. Just goes to show you, if you live in zone 9, even if you live in some other zones, you can grow food in the winter. You can grow food all year round in my region and in a lot of regions. And uh, the benefit of Zone 9 and making videos for you guys is in the spring I'm usually earlier than all the other zones. And so we're going to start our seeds in a couple of weeks, at least some of them. We're going to show you how to start seeds indoors. We're going to show you how to, you know, which ones you should start and which ones you should wait a little bit. And we're going to clean out the garden come, uh, come uh, March the 1st. Everything needs to be out of here. And that's our average last frost date. That's when stuff's going in for the spring garden. But there's a lot to cover in between now and then. In fact, next week I'm going to announce the 2021 uh, Single Seed Challenge. If you did the Single Seed Challenge last year, um, man, it was so fun. Um, there's not really competition. It's just a, a fun thing to do. And it lets us, instead of seeing an ocean of radishes or an ocean of peas, it allows us to take a unique variety and look at that one seed and follow it through its entire life cycle and really appreciate the growth of a plant and uh, what potential there is in a small seed. So we'll have that coming up as well. I'm going to do several other things. I've, I've got a schedule published on my uh, community tab if you want to go take a look at what tentative plans are. What I failed to put on that schedule were uh, the fruit trees, the muscadine grapes, and some of the other projects like compost and garden tools, various things. Those will just be folded in as uh, time allows. But hey, there's our garden tour. It's the first. It's a good, happy new year, I hope. And let's hope that, uh, let's hope that it stays that way. Thanks for joining me on Black Umbo Southern Gardening. If you like our content and you like our channel, please subscribe. I invite you to, to follow us on Instagram as well, where we post photos of the garden and you get to watch it grow. So, hey, have a good new year. Talk to you next time. Bye-bye.